Welcome back. Today we get to do the final reveal of the actual Marilyn dress. Yay! It's exciting! So exciting. I'm flinging my microphone all over the place. It's really fun to wear. I went out for dinner with a friend of mine recently to a relatively smart restaurant. It was a celebration. I thought, I'm going to go as Marilyn because how often do you get the option to do that? And it's quite a big restaurant and it was very dark, you know, they kind of slightly overdo the mood lighting and you end up bumping into things. But on my way to the bathroom, I heard at least two people go, oh, Marilyn Monroe dress. I was like, okay, good. At least it's recognizable, completely out of context. So I must have got it right enough for that to be true. So today I will show you the process for making that up after doing all of the twirls and mock-ups. First thing to say is that the fabric was quite tricky to find. The original was made in a rayon acetate, which was common and new in the 50s, but now doesn't really exist. It's not manufactured, or if it is, it's in, you know, in Greenland or somewhere, so I can't find it. I have therefore had to experiment a lot with different fabrics and figure out what it was that I needed to get the drape and the weight, uh, with the important bit being the skirt being light enough that it would go foom at the right moment. I tried lots of different things. I um, I went with triple crepe, a very lightweight triple crepe. I wanted to use a luxury crepe, but couldn't get it in the right colour. Definitely need to use something synthetic because the pleats stay much better in a synthetic fabric. So it was always going to be polyester. And eventually I went to Rolls and Rems in Lewisham, who were brilliant, and found this beautiful polyester crepe de chine called Powder Touch. I'd never seen it before, but um, that seemed to be a name that everyone recognised, so um, I think it's fairly common. But it's got a lovely, it has that very subtle sheen to it that crepe de chine has, but it does feel powder soft, it's beautiful. And when it was pleated, oh my goodness, it looked so expensive and it really wasn't. I think it cost about three or four pounds a metre. So given I needed a lot uh, in order to make the skirt, it was useful that it was cheap. But the few changes that were made from the mock-ups, I changed the bodice structure quite a lot to make it a lot more substantial and more like a vintage dress. I changed the halter neck detail. I actually drafted that rather than uh, draping it, solely draping it, because I really wanted to make sure the fit was going to be nice and neat and the draping wasn't always that predictable because I'm not that experienced with it. So I thought I'd go back to something I was slightly more experienced with, with the flat pattern drafting, <laughs> though I'm still not that experienced with that. And I used the professionally pleated fabric for the skirt. So in this video, you're going to see the process of putting together that final version. And at the end, there are a load of photographs that my wonderful younger sister took for me, which I love. And I really hope you like too, which I think shows the dress off to its best. Um, so I really hope you enjoy this. It's the culmination of a lot of work. Uh, I'm very proud of it. Yeah, watch away uh, and I'll be back at the end to chat to you about what's coming up after this. So the first thing to talk about is the midsection of the dress, which is actually where all of the structure and support comes because the rest of it is incredibly lightweight. This now consists of three layers, as I decided I wanted to do it a bit more like a true vintage dress, so it's got a lot more structure and support than I was initially thinking I would do. It sits just under the very soft cup of the upper bodice, and I've lengthened the piece compared to my mock-ups because in the photographs it looks longer and I wanted to give myself that, that option so the waistline actually sits right across the very middle if necessary I can always trim off the bottom the top layer is a polyester powder touch crepe de chine and it's been pleated in a half inch flat knife pleat as you can see and I did this in the same way as I did the mock-ups if you've not seen that it's in the video you can see in the top right hand corner and underneath that there is a layer of white light to medium weight triple crepe which is obviously flat and not pleated, and that offers more structure, but it also just provides a lovely back backing for the um, crepe de chine, which is actually a little see-through, as you can see here. So it also brightens up the color ever so slightly, which I quite like. Then on the back, this layer is a fairly stiff, unbleached cotton, like muslin or calico if you're in the UK, and you can see that I've added boning in four places next to the seam lines. It's on the grain, 
because that helps keep the structure of the dress and it's not going to warp in a strange way. And then the two pieces are joined at the centre front. There are six pieces in total sewn together to form princess seams to allow a lot of fitting because dress basically hangs off this particular section so getting the fit right was really important. So the next bit to talk about is the top of the bodice, so the what I'm calling the upper bodice, to the pleated kind of halter neck cup section. And in my mock-ups I'd done this just by draping it on the dress stand, but I decided that I wanted to just see what would happen if I tried to draft it, see whether I could get a more reliable fit. So that's what you can see me doing here now. I'm marking on all of the various markings around where the shoulder line will sit um, and exactly where the grain line will be because all of this is cut on the bias in order to get that nice shaping around the bust. If you cut it straight grain, it might not um, uh, mould to the body as well. So I, I kept it on the bias. And I then started to draw in the various pleat lines I was going to need in order to see exactly what the piece was gonna end up looking like. I actually ended up pleating the fabric first and then cutting it out using this template rather than trying to insert pieces and make a huge pleated pattern piece. And you can see the results here. So it's a bit dodgy looking on the dress stand, but the left hand side is the one with the multiple layers and the pleating done from the pattern piece and the right hand side is the draping and the left gave me a much cleaner finish. So I stuck with that. So this is the two pieces as they were flat when I made them up. So this is with the same layering as the bodice, only it doesn't have the calico layer at the back. So this has got the powder touch crepe de chine pleated on the bias with a half inch knife pleat and then laid on top of the triple crepe plain layer that's sitting underneath it. That will then attach to the pieces for the midsection that we went through earlier in this orientation um, with the bodice piece at the top and then the skirt will hang off the bottom of this fairly obviously and the two pieces will join together at the centre front seam. And then the back pieces actually aren't pleated. It was hard to tell from the photographs whether they were in reality but they looked very flat to me so I saved myself a job and did the back flat and you can see those back panels are then attached onto the front and this is all now sewn together. The middle section coming back to that, this is the belt detail so I'm just I put this on afterwards because it was a detail I didn't want to have to incorporate and it is a false belt. So this is just, I tacked the pieces on to work out positioning and exactly how it was going to look. This really helped flatten down the pleats and create more of a nipped in shape at the waist as well. And once I'd done all of that and put the whole thing together, this is how it looked on the stand. I love this. I think it's got a really Grecian feel, <laughs> which I appreciate. This is not a Grecian dress, but one to hold in the bank for later. But this is the... Um, the final dress but obviously without the skirt on it and this is before I took the skirt to the pleaters um, if you've not seen the pleating video it's well worth a look and you can see that in the top right hand corner now if you'd like to go and check that one out so on this version you can see that the two upper bodice pieces are actually attached separately to the midsection they're not connected to each other and you can see that in this shot however when I wore this I did hand stitch that closed for a couple of inches because it was slightly too indecent for me and this dress doesn't need any help in being more indecent than it already is so on the pictures at the end you'll see that that's slightly more modest. Moving on to the skirt this is the fabric when I brought it back from the pleaters. It's so beautiful. <laughs> it's just such a joy. Every time I got it out, I just thought how lovely it was. So this is the powder touch um, crepe de chine on its own. It's just one layer of the skirt because the pleating is enough that you can't really see through it. Although having said that, every time I've worn it out, I have put a slip, like a nude colored slip underneath it because you know there's always a chance and it is still quite see-through even with the layers that build up as a result of the pleating. So all I've done is measured down the piece to the width that I need the skirt to be. So that's basically my waist measurement divided by two plus a little bit of ease. And I'm now pinning all of the pleats flat with very fine pins because maneuvering this and getting it to attach to the bodice without all of the pleats coming undone is a little tricky. So this was a little bit of a fiddly maneuver. But once it was attached, this is how it looks flat. I appreciate it's not the most gorgeous view in the world. You can't quite tell what's going on. But when the dress is almost done, this is what it looked like flat on the table. And this is what it looked like when it was on the dress form. The belt around the middle that's tied in a bow is actually just a long piece of ribbon I had. I was just trying to see what the final look was. And again, it's got this really lovely Grecian feel to it, but it's really coming together at this point. 
This was the last time the dress was in the studio. After this day I took it home, I hand stitched the belt on properly with a flat fell stitch. I finished off the halter neck details, those were closed with a hook and eye, and I hemmed it, which took blinking ages. <laughs> there is a lot of hem on this dress. Um, my lovely younger sister helped me get some amazing photos. I really wanted some things that conjured up the spirit of the famous photos of Marilyn, and much as <laughs> I am not her, I actually think these came out really well. <laughs> So I hope this inspires some of you to take on some more challenging projects that you might not have otherwise done, pushes you to take on something new that really gets you excited, because that's exactly what this was for me. It was about, you know, re-jizzing my sewing mojo, which I might have written on a tea towel. Um, and it's done that. And it, it was challenging in lots of ways and there were loads of things I had to really kind of struggle with and think about and there were days when I thought, why the crap did I even start this? But I got it done and I finished it and I'm really looking forward to the next one now. So if there's a thing out there that you've always loved and you've never, you know, been brave enough, go for it. Try. What's the worst that can happen? You end up with a completely unwearable garment and you can just throw it in the... Don't throw it in the bin. Use the fabric for something else. Recycle. But, you know, no one's going to know. And it'll teach you something. Absolutely guarantee it. So go out and try the new thing and I will see you guys soon.